Tim asked me if I would read the scriptures. I said it would depend on what scriptures. <laughs> so I will be reading from 1 Corinthians. Uh, verses, 1 Corinthians, first chapter, 18 through 31. Christ, the wisdom and power of God. For the message of the cross is foolish, it's foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. Where is the wise man? Where is the scholar? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolishness the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to say those who were believed. <clears throat> Jews demanded mirac miraculous signs, and Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God, for the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. Brothers, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standing. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly things of this world and despised things, and the things that are not, to nullify the things that are, so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God, that is, our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord.
want to take this opportunity to introduce our speaker, uh, who I asked to speak at this, um, Mark McCormick. He, we got to know each other really good at the Boston seminar, but one of the things that I really appreciate about Mark and, and love about him as a brother in Christ is that I've never met another pastor that has a servant's heart like he does, that actually just cares about the church and people, and, uh, and I've also never met anyone that can connect with as many people as he can. If you get to talk to Mark tonight, within seven minutes, he and you have experienced something together. <laughs> and that is the truth. You've either been to a location he's been, or you'll know someone that he knows, or you'll probably be a cousin before you're done. <laughs> but that unique ability draws people to him, and it drew me to him. And I've really enjoyed getting to know him, and it is my honor to introduce Mark McCormick. On behalf of my son, who's a saxophonist, I have to ask you the question, Dr. John. Is that a Selmer Mark VI? <laughs> I'll tell you. I wondered about that. I know about Selmer Mark. Oh, my goodness. Well, I will have something to report to my son when I tell him about the saxophone duet with the pianist. And I just had a feeling that was a Selmer Mark VI. I've never struck any chord hardly on any instrument. I told you. Any anybody else here ever heard of a Selmer Mark VI? Well, I tell you, there you go. <laughs> On behalf of my lovely wife, Deanne, who is also with me today in full support of this service and the occasion that draws us together, uh, I would like to ask who the arranger of that uh, piece was. I've been buked. Does that ring a bell with you, Deanne? It does not. But my wife is a great ad admirer and doer of choral music, and thank you, choir. And I love the way your choir robes match this sanctuary. That's pretty cool. So, Tim and all of you, it is indeed my honor to share in this service of installation today for my friend, Tim Chappell. So thanks, Tim, for inviting me to this special day with so many people that I am, have been delighted to meet or will yet meet, especially your parents Ed and Sue. And uh, your son Noah and Josh and others that I would like to meet. I wish I had the opportunity to meet all of you in this sanctuary today. But it is always an honor to connect with so many colleagues who have become my friends also even though they're not part of the greatest association of Congregationalists in Michigan, the Central Association. <laughs> We're making wonderful new friends in the Southeastern Association that, if you want to know the truth, is the tail that wags the dog here in Michigan. It's okay. Some of you have driven quite a few miles to be here or perhaps have flown in but most importantly, I do want to greet the members and friends of First Congregational Church of Clarkston. I and we honor you today. You have outdone yourselves, and we can't see, wait to see what's on the menu. <laughs> My wife will appreciate that, too. And I like broccoli if it's nice and soft, okay? But I would like to briefly share a relationship with this church that I have that very few of you know about. Um, 
after a 20-year period when my call to pastoral ministry was on hold for circumstances in my life, some of which were beyond my control, and for most of the years thinking it would be permanently on hold, God had other plans, and I wondered how it would all work if I was ever called back. But somehow, after some honest research, 20 years after my last stint in the pulpit, the pastoral pulpit, I felt like if I were called back to be a minister, I would be a congregational minister. And at the time I began my search, I looked on the website of the NACCC and saw that there were nine churches at that time that had an open pulpit. And I thought at least one church in that nine might consider me to be their pastor. And guess what? Clarkston was the closest church to where Deanne and I live in Flint. What is it? About 24 miles, I think. So, the reason that we wanted somewhere near is it was not in the cards for us to move from our home. So, the church's closest would be the most logical. In my search, I had visited two other congregational churches, both with open pulpits. The pastor of one of those churches is here today. Chris. <laughs> but Clarkston was the closest, and I sneaked out of my lay responsibilities in the church in Flint where I attended, and I drove here on a Sunday morning to experience and participate in worship but also to investigate. And I was so impressed with the building and the property, and I must say the people, when I walked in, I sat back in the second to the last row back on that side. And there were many people here that were very friendly to me. Before the sermon in that service, and Charlie Hall was here that day as the interim minister, someone during the greeting time uh, turned around and greeted me very warmly and asked why I was here. And that presented an instant dilemma because I didn't want to tell them why I was here. I couldn't lie, so she blew my cover and I told her I was an ordained minister and I'd seen that Clarkston was on the list of churches with an open pulpit. She remarked that it must be God's will that I would be there that day and my hope soared. <laughs> She must not have known what was coming. Almost immediately following the greeting time, the chair of the search committee, where are you, Mark? You're the guy, right? You are, is it RT? RT, you're not Mark. Okay, it's RT. I'll get you confused with the other Mark. But nonetheless, it was you. I recognize you. And you got up and you announced the new minister that you had found, the search committee had found, and you gave a wonderful uh, presentation on we have found our guy and it was Tim Chapel. well my soaring spirits dive took a big deep dive uh, so and if, if that person that greeted me is here today I'd like that person later to identify themselves but I quickly slipped out thinking they've found their guy they don't need any more from me and I got in the parking lot and got in my car and drove away and uh, I was quite dejected, to say the least. Um, God had other plans. And while we as human beings make mistakes, even as to the recognition of how and when and where God's call will take place, and as churches we sometimes make dreadful mistakes too, it was not a mistake that Tim Chapel became the pastor of First Congregational Church in Clarkston, Michigan. Neither was it a mistake that, a mistake that a few months later I became the pastor of the Mayflower Congreg Congregational Church, although it'd be nice to have a 24-mile commute instead of a 54-mile commute. <laughs> but I do it, my car gets 42 miles per gallon, and I'm happy doing that. But in the occasion with which we are gathered here today, the scriptures are very enlightening. Paul, in the, pa in the chapter that precede precedes the most well-known, one of the most well-known in all the scriptures, the love chapter that many, could, many of you could identify as 1 Corinthians chapter 13, chapter 12, beginning at verse 12, explains how the body of Christ functions. 
though one body, drinking from the same spirit, there are many members, each with a unique and important function. And I think Tim Chappell is one of the most unique people I've ever met in my life. But before I elaborate on that, I want to say, first of all, that as a complete body, the body of Christ, this church has a unique opportunity. Rarely have I seen such a beautiful church building on such a beautifully and strategically located piece of property in a lovely community with beautiful surroundings, including a place that I want to take my wife after the service, and it's around the pond. What do you call that, Tim? The prayer walk. That's what I have listed. I just wasn't sure about that. And around the pond, the adjacent large open field where at least uh, there was a thought that Kid Rock would be landing there in a helicopter before the, uh, you probably heard about that, before the big concert over here, and a gymnasium where we shall all gather after the service. Now I know this wasn't all done without some controversy, perhaps disagreement and financial burden, but trust me folks, and I'm speaking to the members and friends of the First Congregational Church of Clarkston, you have and continue to have a unique opportunity to do a great work for God in this community, and should I say you are doing a great work for God. And I have to put in just a little bit of a plug for a couple things that Tim and I do outside the ministry. Tim, as you know, was a professional window washer. That sounds really important, doesn't it? And I am a professional painter, which also sounds really important. So this Tuesday, and uh, I don't know how many of the trustee members are here, this last Tuesday, Tim and I got together, and he got his, his window washing outfit out, and I brought my power washer, and, I, and Tim wanted to know why there was a little dinginess on this side of the church and not the rest side of the church. And I said, Tim, it's because it's the north side. So I don't know how many of you noticed it, but uh, some of that moss and collection out there is gone and I all I can tell you is Tim and I had a blast doing it last Tuesday well Tim is a unique guy but we are unique in our congregational way today was the third Visnage council that I have attended some like to call it the ecclesiastical council did I see a little bit of pushback in the latest edition of the congregationalist nonetheless it is very unique. It is inspiring to hear the faith story of the one who has been called to serve in the capacity of pastor-teacher with the gift of the prophetic voice. It is unique that we come together as churches in the vicinity to confer confirm and affirm and to offer covenantal guidance to the local congregation. And I sat in, uh, in on that as a non-voting member with a voice and as Jerry reminded me today, I took opportunity to have the voice, but it was a wonderful, wonderful time. And to recognize that while we associate, collaborate, collaborate and congregate, we are reminded that where two or three are gathered, there is Christ in the center of all we do. We are unique, especially in the mainline tradition, that each local church and body of believers is unique and complete. And I say it many times, and I'll say it again today, it is not the only way, but it is our way, and it is a good way. Thanks be to God. Now, it goes without saying that you have a very unique pastor, as I made reference, who has been called to serve as your pastor teacher. Tim and I became instant friends when we met at the minister's convocation in Adrian in April of 2018. We connected, and Tim, I'm proud, very proud and humbled that you chose me to be a friend of yours. We've shared together, we've prayed together, we've laughed together, we've laughed a lot together, we cried together, We've learned together in Boston, and this past week, we've worked together. And Tim is not afraid to get his hands dirty. A professional window washer and a professional painter it took me two days to get the little bit of paint. We did a little painting around here. Sorry, trustees, we just took it on ourselves. Now, Tim is a hard worker. And he has definite opinions and perspectives, like I do, some quite different from mine, but he has an open heart. And the rare quality among all of us 
with a truly open mind. A Southern Baptist who wants to learn how to be a Congregationalist. Go figure. <laughs> when those of us who were at that congregation where we heard Tim share his journey into the Congregational way, we were at one minute laughing uncontrollably, then weeping uncontrollably the next minute as Tim shared his very unique and moving faith story. And I'm sure many, if not most of you, have heard it. If not, I hope you have the chance. And then the role of that faithful pastor who reached out to him and would not give up on what was then a hard heart. The call of God upon his life, then the call to be a pastor. Tim has the gift of incredible and natural compassion, so much so that he wants to give away all of his money to others uh, so that his wife has to handle the finances, I understand. And now I know that Tim wants to give away all the church's money, too. And uh, when I found out what the pastor's discretionary fund was, I was amazed and thought if I could get a fraction of that at Mayflower, I'd be lucky. Then I found out it was all gone and Tim was asking for more. It comes out of a heart of compassion. And Tim sees every soul as a reachable soul. And Tim, your laughter, your comedic gift and unique brand of humor, your compassion, your enthusiasm, your passion, your energy, your story, the way you think outside the box, and most of all, your love for people and your love for Christ. You inspire us and you challenge us. And remember this, Clarkston Church, it is always, always easier to control a fire than it is to start one. D did you get that? Yeah. Yeah. I know how that feels a little bit. Remember that with your new pastor, not so new anymore. Every church has ghost stories. And one of the most common I hear is the difficulty of getting someone off their proverbial duff and do something. You have not had, nor will you have, that problem with Tim Chapel. Finally, it is not only Tim Chapel that is unique. We all are unique. We are all created, created in the beautiful and wonderful and amazing image of God. We have unique personalities. We have unique gifts. We have unique stories, un unique perspectives, and certainly unique experiences. But once again, the scriptures remind and enlighten us as to how these gifts are to be understood. Paul, writing to the Corinthian church, instructs the church in this regard. Those who have gifts that are considered to be less honorable are the gifts that are to be clothed with the greatest honor. If you preach the lectionary, and some do, some don't, doesn't matter, but if you have, the last couple or three weeks have emphasized this in the ministry of Christ. We are to rethink who it is that gets invited to our banquets. We are to rethink where they sit at our celebrations. In our church, after I preached on these matters in the gospel, I was compelled to do something. Two little things we did that I simply announced without any approval. I took a page right out of your book, Tim. We serve a community meal once a month, a fantastic ch a chicken dinner, well attended. We sell it out almost every time. We charge $10, a veritable bargain, especially with an army of volunteers that come around your table and fill your coffee and your water and ask if you'd like more or something else. Well, it would be a bargain except for one of the least in our congregation who attends our church and wants to partake of that meal, but $10 once a month is heavy on her budget. She is now paid in advance for the rest of the year. And the last meal of the year in May, we shall offer the meal free of charge to everyone. I just was warned not to do it ahead of time. We're not prepared to serve those that might show up. Those are just little things. But little things become big things. And these are not in any way revolutionary ideas, but things that remind us of the heart and soul of what Jesus taught. He didn't call the righteous, but sinners to repentance and to the abundant life. 
His teaching should inform our politics, but it must inform, inform our theology. I think Tim is in on this. I want to be in on this. And I'm confident we will all be in on this. Those who have ears to hear, let them hear. Hallelujah. Amen. Is that part of the service in which we invite our minister being installed to come forward and actually uh, participate with his presence and his voice in this great event that we share together as churches of Southeast Michigan and of Central and, and Western associations and especially the First Congregational Church of Clarkson. I would invite Tim to come forward right up here. And he's now just taken from, just incidentally, a very uh, historic book that many of us know as the Red Book, the Congregational Worship Book uh, by Henry David Gray. And uh, so, um, I to change things up a bit, just a little bit. I'm wearing the red robe. Tim, don't go sit down. What 
I want you to do, Tim, is I want you to stand in the center of the sanctuary. And then I would like all the ministers and family members and anyone else who wants to be involved in this to surround him and lay hands on him for prayer. If you can't directly touch him, that's okay. The Holy Spirit can go work through you as you are connected. Let us, let us pray. Lord God, we come before you. Lord God, we come before you and we are humbled in your presence. You alone have the authority to bestow upon Tim the gifts to lead, to minister, to love the great people of this church and the community around it. Set Tim apart that he would be able to lead, to preach, to forgive, to heal, and to serve. Give him, give him insight and compassion for the lost and those that are alone. Deepen and enrich Tim's life and his ever-growing love for you, his Lord and his Savior. Lord God, it is through you we ask you to install Tim as minister of First Congregational Church of Clarkston. And may your light shine through him always. In the name of the one and only King we serve, in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, I say, and all the people say, Amen. Amen.
Good afternoon, everybody. We've all been taught that eavesdropping is not a courteous thing to do. However, when we find ourselves in a situation where people are talking loudly and openly, it is a very hard temptation to resist listening in. In an installation service, there is a portion of that service that we have arrived at now that is called the charge to the pastor. And by design, this is a portion of the service that is a conversation from me to Tim. Everything else has been addressing the entire group. But by design, you're invited to eavesdrop. Tim, the mantle of being a pastor is a heavy mantle in many ways. And I want to start by talking about that very briefly. We see the weight of it in the words of the Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy 5.17, who says that the elders who direct the affairs of the church well are worthy of a double honor, especially those whose work is teaching and preaching. If the Apostle thought that that was the case for someone who is in your position, then that tells us that the role that you play in this particular body here in Clarkston is a pretty important role. We know that it's an important role because uh, of all the different positions that people will hold in this body of Christ, you're probably one of the only ones that they will use your role as part of your identity. You're Pastor Tim. You don't refer to this gentleman as choir director, unless you're joking, maybe, and being, being silly. You don't call the custodian by their name. You don't necessarily promote it that way, but the role of pastor is different because it is special. So special that James, the half-brother of Jesus, warns that not many of you should presume to be teachers because we who teach will be judged more strictly. On one hand, we like the idea of a double honor if we're honor seekers. But the reality is, it's a dangerous profession. And so, I want to give you the advice that I have read and gleaned from a few different presidents of what was once Princeton College. I'm going to need my glasses for this one. First of all, we'll start with the words of Jesus, who was asked about the greatest command in the whole Bible. In Matthew chapter 22, he, said, uh, he was asked, Teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commands. And these commands are not only commands for the people that you shepherd, it's also a command for you. Tim, you must, must, always, must never cease. You must love God. And then you must love the people. Samuel Davies was the fourth president of Princeton. Some people will say he's the greatest preacher that the West has ever produced. This is what he wrote about the character of a preacher. Let a minister of Christ ascend the sacred desk with a heart glowing with the love of souls. And what an amiable, engaging figure does he make. Love gives a smooth, though sharp edge to his address. Love animates his persuasions and exhortations. Love breathes through his invitations and renders them irresistible. Love brightens the evidence of conviction and sweetly forces it upon unwilling minds. My glorious and condescending Lord has appointed me the most pleasing work. He only requires me to show myself a lover of souls. Souls 
whom he loves and whom he redeemed. If at any point in the process of carrying out your duties as a pastor to this flock, you cease to love them, you have immediately failed in the second of the great commandments. And then there is the greatest. A man must love God and love men with everything he has, or it's no good even trying to be a minister, says Arthur Rauner. These words are from Ashbel Green. He was the eighth president of Princeton College. He says this about love for God. If a man of learning appears who is confessedly and eminently pious, who it is acknowledged by all considers affection for Christ as superior to learning itself, superior to every earthly object and consideration, whose holy life and ardent labors in the cause of Christ have put him above all suspicion, this man they will hear, and to him they will listen. John Witherspoon said that pious is, uh, is a firm belief in the gospel. In our day and age, the word pious is actually uh, an insult. Someone who thinks too much of themselves, someone who's overly religious. But piety is a firm belief in the gospel and a lively sense of religion upon your own heart. Tim, you can't give people what you don't have. And everything that we have is from God and finds its beginnings in him. As you preach and as you serve, you must understand yourself as a dying man who is preaching to a dying congregation. That everything about your life must carry the evidence of the truth you preach. And when it does, you will be most satisfied. Your congregation will be most nourished. And the glory of God will be most exalted. Whatever your colleagues, whatever area churches, whatever they may use to measure the success of your ministry in this place, you must measure it by the depth of your love for the God whom you proclaim and the love you possess for the men and women and boys and girls entrusted to your care. God bless you, my friend.
we have had the charge to the minister. And now I get to take a little wider view. Now I am addressing the church, First Congregational Church of Clarkston. And uh, this, is, this is your charge. I, I want to just, even though I am talking to you, I I'm, I'm just want to say about your minister, I'm going to tell on him right now a little bit. Um, he was almost what I would call giddy with delight at certain points while he was in Boston this summer, not just when we were eating gelato. But uh, um, see, though, he came to learn about congregationalism, but there was also a little side mission that he was on, and that was to connect with his long-ago ancestor, John Howland. And uh, uh, he found his ancestor, John Howland. And I'm not just talking about how he found him. He found John Howland's grave on top of Burial Hill, but he also got to meet John Howland in the flesh, sort of, at Plymouth Plantation, uh, when he got to spend about 10 minutes conversing with the reenactor portraying John Howland. And uh, this was uh, one of his, his long ago ancestors that came across on the Mayflower and almost didn't make it, too, for, for going overboard. And, and, uh, but uh, um, it, it was a thrill. I mean, it was a thrill for him, and it became a thrill for us. Um, I, I have a lot of fun taking people to Boston and Plymouth as part of the Boston Seminar in Congregational History and Polity, but I have to say this was a high point for me even as, as it was for Tim. There's nothing like the Boston Seminar to bring people together. Tim already had, as, as you've seen today, many friends throughout the Michigan Conference and even the National Association of Congregational Christian Churches. But I do think that the Boston Seminar added another layer to the relationships that he had with others in the association and even his relationship with the congregational way itself. I commend this church, and I cannot commend it highly enough, for encouraging his participation not only in the Boston Seminar, but also in ministers' convocations, clergy retreats, other meetings and conferences that build up this fellowship. I've been asked, as I said, to give a charge to the congregation, and I have to tell you that it is my honor to do it for this church, First Congregational Church of Clarkston. This congregation was founded by the renowned Reverend Isaac Ruggles as part of the move westward in the early half of the 1800s. It is indeed one of our oldest congregational churches in Michigan and was active in, in, in really championing the cause for uh, remaining in what we tend to call continuing congregation during the so-called merger controversy in the mid uh, in the mid 1900s you have a stake in the heritage of our beloved association of churches and i can tell you we all value you for holding on to that identity it is an important identity and it is something to be so very proud of so my charge to you, just as your minister is doing, renew yourselves in the congregational way of being church. Reverend Tim has told me more than once how he's come to embrace this way, and many of us here know that. We've seen it. We've heard it. Please let him lead you in exploring this rich and vibrant way of being church, just as past leaders you have had through the decades have done. Maintain the connections that bring life to your community and support your minister not only to attend to these relationships himself, but actually to join him in doing so. Your presence matters. It matters to him and it matters to us. Of course, I also charge you to support your minister in other ways. Give him the resources that he and his household need to be healthy so that he may help this church to be as healthy as possible in all ways. 
Grant to him the time to be away and to refresh himself in prayer, in time spent with his family, and to be able to connect regularly with friends and other colleagues. I'm also aware that this is a unique blending here of two distinct congregations at this point in your church's life. With that, there are surely differences among the ways in which each understands church and your common life. That's just natural. Blessings on all of you as you continue to navigate your shared community together. I also know that there have been many new things, and I suspect there will persist in being many new things that have taken your minister by surprise. Help him to grasp the traditions that are important to you and learn to communicate and express why they are important to you. Not just that we do it this way because we've always done it this way, but rather why it's important to you. What a difference it makes to you and your faith journey. In so doing, you will grow together and grow stronger most effectively. Teach one another and be patient with each other where, there, where these differences emerge and occur. Try not to make assumptions and ask many, many questions. I, and I have to acknowledge that Tim is very, very good about that part of it. And, and blessings on you. As I've mentioned before, it's truly a wonderful thing that you value the opportunities that he can have to be in fellowship with congregational ministers and in our conference and associations. And I'm personally grateful for your assisting in making this a priority for Tim. It is a gift to know him and to relate with him as both a colleague and as a friend. I've found the congregational way to be most effectively lived out when relationships are made, nurtured, and encouraged to develop. Like the connection that Tim made with John Howland in Plymouth, I hope that we all, pastor and church, church and association of churches, can foster those relationships that bring meaning and purpose and perpetual growth to the journey of faith that we share. God bless you, First Congregational Church of Clarkston, as you carry forth your historic congregational heritage and partner with your minister to see it move you in exciting new directions of faith and spirit.
want to say thank you to everyone who came and uh, celebrated with me this installation. And, and I do want to thank all of my fellow colleagues. I know what it's like to give up a Sunday evening, to travel two and a half hours, to celebrate with somebody else. It's exhausting. You've already put all of your work in today. You're exhausted. I took your nap time. <laughs> I apologize. But I will never forget the sacrifice you made today. Thank you for coming and being part of this with me. I would ask if you would process out so that people from our church can also thank you as they leave. As for the church, I can honestly say that it has been a privilege being your pastor for the last couple of years. It has been a joy to meet many of you and become friends with many of you. When we took this church and we merged the two churches together and we became one big happy family, it was tricky. <laughs> but there is one thing that God does more than anything else, and that is through Christ unify us. And he did that. And today we celebrate a piece of connecting with our history and an installation. But I want to be honest with you, I have never been more loved than I have been in this church. I appreciate your kindness to me and my family. The love you've shown us, the hospitality, the care. It means you'll never know this side of heaven what it means to me as a pastor to be loved in this church. So thank you for being here. Let me pray, and then we get to eat. Go down and grab your spot.